Tina. Thank you so much to Jeremy Pitt um, and a very warm welcome to you to the 15th workshop on the social implications of national security. My name is Roba Abbas and I'm a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Wollongong, Australia. And I'm delighted to be moderating this next session on the theme of securitization through transdisciplinarity with Ms. Mariana Seferakopoulos, a former federal law enforcement public servant and currently at the University of Technology Sydney. Mariana is also an adjunct, um, has an adjunct role and other roles at Charles Sturt University and the University of Sydney. And on behalf of our co-organizers, Professor Katina Michael, Jeremy Pitt and Kathleen Vogel, Mariana and I would like to welcome you to this session, which is session three of four and is about uh, exploring and addressing complex societal securitization related challenges that really transcend, transcend disciplinary boundaries. So these challenges demand transdisciplinary approaches that incorporate and integrate a variety of disciplinary perspectives and multi-stakeholder perspectives. Um, and as such, this session will cover themes such as critical thinking and the new normal, vulnerability, infrastructure, internet access, uh, necessity, ethical use, ways of knowing, and so much more. So welcome to session three, securitization through transdisciplinarity. And I'll hand over to you, um, Mariana, for some housekeeping. Thank you very much, Robo. Warm welcome to you all. Um, and if I may quickly, before I get into housekeeping, we just heard about the importance of ritual one of the very important things we do here in Australia is acknowledging our, the tradi traditional custodians of our land. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm connecting to you all from Gadigal country. I want to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of our lands here, uh, past, present and future. And I pay respects to that traditional custodianship and knowledge. I know we're all um, very keen, waiting with, with bated breath to hear from our very distinguished and esteemed uh, Professor Emeritus Lewis Kuhn, who's the IEEE President-Elect uh, for Society and Social Implications of Technology. And we'd like to give you a very warm welcome and uh, invite you to, to kick us off with your presentation today. I truly appreciate being invited uh, to to this session. Um, I uh, I think the the theme is extremely complex. Uh, my way of thinking and of presenting might be a little bit different than what you're used to. I suggest that you just uh, relax and and try to capture uh, because there are going to be very many horizontal connections that normally people don't look at. And I think that complexity and uh, looking at uh, these uh, issues through the lenses of multidisciplines and interdisciplines will give you a complete different flavor in many cases of what's going on. Um, there is a word called a threat that uh, for hospitals administrators in, in Britain, uh, might be a ransomware. Uh, for people in movies, it's Netflix. For people in the mall, it's internet. Uh, for FedEx and UPS is the postal service in the here in the US. Um, for this small shop, might be the supermarkets. Um, for the old companies, might be in, in OPEC, it might be the electric cars. Uh, for the electric cars, it might be the batteries that are causing fires. Um, for the people in TSA at the airport, might be the bottle that contains water. But for the environmentalists, it's not that water, it's actually the plastic of the bottle. And for the public health official, is neither the plastic nor uh, that water. It's it's what the water might have, if it's bacteria, virus, or whatever. Um, of course, if we talk to policemen, they tend to see threats on guns, uh, bombs, uh, knives, while the firefighter sees it in smoke and fire, and the physician on bacteria and viruses, and the cook in the temperature of the stove or the oven. Uh, I could be going on and on, but my, my, my point is that if you invite one of these individuals to write a paper about threats and you invite the spectrum, you're going to have two complete different papers. And, and that's, that's uh, 
my my first message to you the importance um, i'd be talking uh, giving a lot of examples of critical thinking that in in my way uh, of, of thinking it's uh, it's lacking um, i will be touching on critical infrastructures interdependencies climate change um, healthcare transformation and I'll explain a little bit on that and how everything is connected and yet disconnected. Um, this is just a chart. Uh, when we had over 500,000 dead of COVID in the USA, uh, very few authorities took the time to see that in many other countries, uh, there were very few. And this might be cultural differences, perhaps of just wearing a mask. Uh, and yet they would not use that, that information on the benefit of the population. Um, we have gone here in the US through a lot of changes uh, because healthcare here is extremely uh, expensive, but also trying to improve the quality of life. Uh, my focus has been shifting from uh, diagnosing and curing to going to the doctor when you're well uh, and, uh, and focus on wellness through prevention. And I use this paradigm throughout national security issues and so on. Uh, of course, in the case of health, genetics, public health, informatics, geomedicine play a, a big, big role biovigilance uh, and, uh, and done from home and uh, dealing with uh, non-communicable diseases is uh, a wonderful solution. Islands of excellence is uh, a lot of the isolation that we have. As I mentioned before, critical thinking is lacking and interoperability is not understood. Okay, um, you may remember uh, this event that happened uh, on Northern Africa, where um, every time there were uh, lots of groups of people getting together, their governments uh, kept cutting their internet and their cell phones. Um, this is a chart that showcases that every time that the price of food went up, um, the people would go out to manifest. And uh, my point is that uh, going all the way from Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Argelia, uh, Libya, Egypt, and then to the Middle East, lots of those governments fell. Uh, and I believe that if the price of food would have gone down, uh, they would still be on power. This is another example on how disease moves around uh through through birds and a lot of people right now might not be paying attention but there is an h5n1 pandemic going on uh, that is covering uh lots of parts of canada and the us you might say what's is this such a big deal well um, i've been checking uh this was as late as uh, a few days ago november 2nd uh, Thanksgiving is coming here and uh, we're going to be eating turkey and many people could get sick from eating turkey. Uh, these are the type of things that a lot of uh, folks are not paying attention and they should. Um, in tw 2010, we had the earthquake that destroyed uh, basically everything in Haiti. Uh, Ten months later, there was uh, the first outbreak of cholera. And uh, within three years, there were 685,000 people contaminated, about 10,000 dead. Uh, the problem was that uh, the authorities uh, look uh, at the problem of as an infectious disease, which it is, uh, but cholera in some ways, from my perspective, was a symptom. Uh, the real disease is that they didn't have um, sustainable water infrastructure. And the only ones that can fix that are civil engineers that understand pipes. Uh, 
they, they never came to the picture. And of course, if the water is contaminated, there goes the agriculture, the food chain, public health. Um, this is a situation where um, you had no electricity, no telecommunications, but by using satellite phones and charging the batteries of those phones uh, over a blanket with solar energy, they could access databases on a cloud, for example, where they could have the GIS coordinate of each one of those 685,000 individuals because there's no way to store it. The infrastructure is gone there. But thanks to technology, you can enlighten yourself and accommodate things outside. This is similar to hap what happens with Katrina, where all the files of patients uh, were destroyed because New Orleans is a city that is uh, built on the water level. Uh, yet the Veterans Administration that has an electronic system that connects all their hospitals and the data is somewhere else is the only thing. Um, during uh, a meeting of uh, defense ministers in Uruguay, the last day, I, I went as an observer. Uh, this was the cup holder for, for the glass. A lady asked us to turn it around. Uh, and that's what the code that appeared and said, use your phone. It doesn't matter if it's an iPhone or uh, a Samsung. Um, and the system will tell you the meat that you were about to eat, where it came from. Basically, every animal, right, 12 million cows and about another so many sheep uh, have an RFID card and a visual card that follows them all their lives. And uh, down there, uh, you have the GIS coordinates of the owner. If the animal is sold, the coordinates obviously change. Uh, but this permits that as the animal later is uh, killed, cut, put into boxes and sold, that number continues with the uh, uh, with the animal. Imagine in a future when you have um, in your refrigerator uh, ways of uh, sensing uh, and sending information to the supermarket. Uh, those sensors can tell them that you're running out of meat, but also the supermarket could alert you that the meat that is in your refrigerator is contaminated because they can do traceability. This is a very important issue, which would bring into the picture uh, for healthcare, the Department of Commerce, because every box that comes into any country is usually recorded by, by, that, uh, by that group. Um, I gave a talk in 2011 uh, and the reporter basically wrote, when, uh, when Kuhn talks about, um, safety and security, he's not talking about police or the armed forces. And the reason is that the number one product in Uruguay is meat. Um, if uh, there is a disease called aftosa, that if any animal gets it, they close the borders. That means that there are no financial transactions. Uh, the economy uh, can go into ruins. Uh, so it's a national security issue. But the only one that can solve that problem is a veterinarian. In the years 2002, 2004, 2008, um, I was like guest editor of these three numbers. The two things that I did differently uh, for the first time in IEEE is I invited senators from both sides of the aisle. It didn't matter. Uh, how, how uh, bad they were towards the, the right, the left. Um, but I invited both Democrats and Republicans and people from the administration. Uh, the first number was on bioterrorism, how uh, biomedical engineering could help. Uh, the second one was on Homeland Security. The third one was on um, the, the critical infrastructure of healthcare and public health. Um, I made uh, IEEE USA to distribute this numbers 
to members of Congress. The reason for this is because most uh, congressional leaders, they are the ones that will fund your projects, but they have no idea of science or technology. And uh, I, I think that that's one of the things that I will pursue at SSIT, to help people uh, write less integral equations and more language that is digestible by somebody that does not have that type of a background so that and invite them to our conferences so they can follow um, similar to what Al Gore did in the 80s with the high performance computers and communications that later became uh, the internet when the and, and by the way in one of those numbers I discussed uh, that perhaps the idea of creating the Department of Homeland Security was not such a good idea. They put 22 agencies, and I showed with this example that was on the first uh, journal, um, very different examples, a ship carrying uh, chemicals, uh, somebody with an envelope with anthrax, uh, the cornfields in Nebraska, or the uh, cattle in Iowa uh, being contaminated, uh, the water contamination uh, where, you know, it would involve public health, obviously, uh, gases like sar sarin uh, that happened in Tokyo some, some years ago, uh, and when uh, um, crashing against a nuclear reactor, uh, somebody, a tourist coming already with some form of smallpox that it was not detected because the person had no symptoms yet. Uh, somebody uh, in cyberspace changing the guidelines of the CDC, uh, where it says do, put do not, or change amounts and so on. What I tried to say is what we need is all those 22 agencies to be interconnected uh, and share information. You don't need to have them today with technology in the same building or being part of the same agency. But, and this is the lack of interoperability that I was uh, briefing. Each of these uh, columns depend from CDC, from the Department of Energy, in the case of a nuclear reactor, from the federal uh, uh, the FAA for the Cessna airplane, um, the cornfields and, uh, and the cattle from the Department of Agriculture, uh, the water contaminants from the Environmental Protection Agency and so on. You may remember uh, Notre Dame, the fire in 2019. In the U.S., monuments and icons are considered a uh, critical infrastructure. For the French, it is not. And I will show something that perhaps you're not aware. Uh, this is where they give importance them you know, to some basic human needs, sovereignty, economics, technological. Uh, but Notre Dame is the number one place visited by tourists. And if you, one of the key issues of uh, critical infrastructures is that if something goes bad, you need to be able, uh, with help from the government and every other source, to recover because this affects the economy of the country in this case. In, in a, so when you look at, at Sacre Coeur, Louvre, Eiffel Tower, Palace of Versailles, they could be part of that infrastructure, which in this case, it wasn't. Uh, but in my view, they should be. Each country has a different uh, incorporation. There are some that are common, like uh, energy and electricity, uh, water in many cases, telecommunications for sure, banking and financials. But all the others, you, you can see it's all scattered around. These are the ones from the U.S. And uh, the... Big uh, issue is that 85% of this infrastructure, in the case of the U.S., depends from the private sector. In many other places, uh, they are owned by the government. 
And um, so if you have a company like IBM, um, they do not necessarily want Hew the Hewlett Packards of this world to know what their vulnerabilities are because there's a business aspect. And, and that makes it very difficult for the government, which is the one that has to protect them. So you have the different sectors here. Of course, there are tensions because of natural threats, accidental threats, uh, deliberate threats. Uh, and of course, there is deterioration, innovation, globalization, decentralization. Uh, and some places that are regulated, others that are not. Um, and then, of course, you have the interdependencies among them. Uh, and uh, there is a, a uh, drawing that I use uh, in that first uh, number of in that magazine, which shows this. Basically, you have two columns. One is electricity, the other one, telecommunications. And then all the infrastructures go through there. Uh, so you, if any of those goes down, they all go down because they're all really interconnected. So uh, some people look at as a system of networks and therefore uh, this becomes a big deal. On uh, July uh, 30th of 2012, there was a blackout in India. The throughput, and it affected 600 million people there. But in the US, if your Dell computer went down and you call an 800 number, uh, it was not necessarily answered in India. Uh, it might, depending on the time of the day, it could have been answered in Uruguay, Argentina, or Chile, which through this company called Tata, uh, they subcontract for the worst hours of the day. Uh, what is the big deal? Well, uh, this is uh, here near the Suez Canal. It's where that cable was cut and you produce that reduction uh, by 75%. The, if you're writing a national strategy and you do not include India now uh, or the countries in South America, then you, you are having a very narrow bandwidth and you're going to have problems. You, because of globalization, you need to incorporate what others are doing into your own strategy. This is a talk that I gave on June um, 6, 6 uh, 2019. I was asked to open the first cyber defense uh, seminar in Argentina. And I spoke about this interdependency among all infrastructures. Um, I gave the same talk on the 10th in Uruguay. And on the 16th, there was a complete blackout. Uh, serendipity, I do not know what to call it, but that's exactly what happened. All of Argentina was blacked out, all of Uruguay, and of course, all types of issues, because in addition to all of that, uh, uh, people, for example, the, the drinking water, the filters are electronic, the, uh, the tanks, you know, you have generators for hospitals, but as the um, gasoline or diesel starts going down, the only way to fill them up, it was electronically. And if you have not practiced, then you, you don't have a plan for continuity of operations, which is obviously essential for this type of things. Um, there was a similar blackout that affected 60 million people in Brazil. Uh, NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, said here that it was due to the weather. But a few weeks later, 60 Minutes said, no, it was hacking. And, and now you have a problem because no one, in my view, is very reliable, but so is 60 Minutes. But one of those two is not correct. Who do you trust? Which obviously it brings us to all these conspiracy theories, fake news, misinformation, social media effects, information spreading very fast. Who do you believe? Very, very difficult. On the left, you see the infrastructures. SSIT, I think, looks at social aspects of things that can occur there. 
and these is the other bridge. SSIT also has connection to another 38 other societies of IEEE. So I believe that is a great connection where we can basically uh, help with this social and technical issues that are going on. I'm gonna show you something in terms of an incident management so you can see what goes on when somebody might call 911, uh, that local emergency operations center response, it goes to multiple jurisdictions and commands. Uh, there might be a, a state uh, emergency operations center. If it's high enough, it might go into the White House and public alerts might be given. Of course, there are all types of uh, wireless communications going on between law enforcement, first responders, but there are also uh, tools that are doing threat ass assessment, both vulnerability analyses, demographics and infrastructure intelligence to know who did what. Uh, there are emergency planning, contingency plans, consequence management, uh, all these utility tools, HASMAT, uh, and uh, situation awareness and collaboration um, and connection with other federal agencies. Well, behind each of these, there are companies and each one has a technology. Those technologies are not automatically connecting to each other. So that's that's a big, big task. So here you would have the functions that they have to look together to create a, a interoper interoperability uh, uh, environment that is good for everyone. Um, on the other side, when the water in the Gulf of Mexico is red, some people worry if they can swim, others if they can eat the fish. These two items belong to two separate committees in Congress, one that deals with environment, one with food protection. They don't talk to each other. We don't have regulations that are good enough because they are always partial. Uh, California will require all vehicles by 2030 to uh, to be electric. And um, I I had a, a short video, but I'm not going to pass it. But it's it's on uh, available on the internet. Uh, but already because of the fires produced by the batteries, countries like Germany are doubting in terms of using electric transportation. This is the video that I was telling you was filmed in China, but. Suddenly, as the batteries were charging, uh, smoke start coming out uh, because of video cameras that were capturing that. And immediately the next you know, fire came to one bus, then the next one, and then the next one. So huge losses. Of course, you have all types of risks uh, that are dynamic and changing. And uh, even last year, we have this uh, eruption. And some people say, oh, how lucky that house is entirely. But people don't realize that the infrastructure that supports that house is completely gone. There's no water. There is no electricity. There is no gas because everything is covered now by rock. Uh, so you have a wonderful house where you cannot live because, you know, those governments are not going to start creating a new infrastructure for your house. Um, October, September, October, big, big earthquakes uh, going on. They started with a 6.9 on September 18th in Taiwan. And, uh, but, but we had other issues like the re radioactivity from uh, all the problems on Fukushima and what happens in terms of emergency crisis and, and management and rescuing. Uh, in countries like ours, we have these things happening at the same time, floods, tornadoes, and, and wildfires in different parts. Uh, if we look at the world globally, right now, there are 44,000 square miles in Pakistan that are flooded, and 33 million people's lives are at stake. In East Africa, there are 22 million people and we're talking about Kenya, um, up, 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 Yemen, 
Somalia and Ethiopia. They all have no water and uh, their, their cattle is, is dying. So what I want to show you uh, really, really fast is uh, a glimpse because uh, in, in, in terms of what's going on, both with water and with droughts simultaneously. Uh, and by the way, uh, although you might see a presentation of mine some years ago that might have similar titles, I update with things that are happening right now. So the dates that I'm talking to you are September, October of this year, okay? And uh, some, you remember last year, floods in Europe, uh, some problems here, 80 million people, perhaps with problems September of this year here. This was Ian in Florida at the end of September. This complete destruction. And by the way, if if uh, there is a concept of local and global and global and local, COVID is a great example. Uh, it doesn't matter what's happening globally because you have to deal with your local problem. But local issues become global and global issues become local. And, and uh, the people in, in Florida with this type of disaster, they cannot think what's going on in, in Pakistan, as I mentioned to you, or East Africa, because they don't have. Now, these are the ones that are gonna go very fast, but, but it's all on the internet, you can see it. Uh, floods in Philippines, Spain, Cameroon, uh, USA, Mali, Croatia, Indonesia, Vietnam and Thailand, Central African Republic, Nigeria, Ghana, Thailand, again, India, Trinidad and Tobago, Indonesia, Chad, Venezuela, Central America. And by the way, that, uh, that storm went over Salvador, Guatemala, Panama, Nicaragua, Honduras, and was heading to Mexico. So uh, in mid-October, it was hitting Acapulco and all that. Indonesia, South Sudan, Vietnam, Nigeria, Cambodia, Australia, Mexico, Greece, Chad. And the reason I, I put that earthquake in uh, Taiwan was because in addition to that, while you're trying to recover from that, you're suddenly now in October, you have floods. Um, so these, these are very difficult times and it's Typhoon in Taipei as well. Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Nigeria again. And this is what I was telling you about Pakistan. And of course, besides the water, uh, now remember Pakistan, on top of everything, is the third producer of agriculture in Asia. So if everything is flooded, somebody's gonna suffer the consequences of that. We have a war in Ukraine and Russia. That region that produces 30% of the grain worldwide feeds 52 countries that if they don't get the grain, they can go into famine. And those countries that I mentioned before, Somalia, Ethiopia, Yemen, and Kenya get the grains from, from that area affected by the war. So uh, here is that you have billions of mosquitoes, but you have the problems of cholera, gastroenteritis, and on and on, you know, many, many problems. The pictures uh, speak. Also the glaciers because of climate change are melting. This, in addition to the rain has created even a lake that is a hundred uh, kilometers wide inside that territory. So that land now suddenly uh, is not usable for agriculture. You have 1.1 million dead livestock and so on. And of course, depending on how much the increase will be, uh, so much precipitation will follow. In terms of extreme heat and drought, these are all coming from the US, but also 
stress problems all over the place. Uh, ranchers do not know if to keep animals because they don't have water to feed them. And, uh, and they are thinking twice what to plant because those plants that require lots of water, they, they will not make it. Uh, yet, uh, this picture here shows uh, a flood in Dallas of 15 inches, uh, an inch is 2.54 centimeters. So, uh, but it's a zone that is completely dry. But in one day, they had all that water. We have all these things going on, changes in this case, because of the temperatures rising so much, people will have to move from those areas because uh, it, may, it might not be uh, possible for human life to deal with such high temperatures. This is the area I mentioned to you in East Africa. These are the animals as they die. Uh, and this is in the US, Las Vegas, start growing and uh, of course people wanted to have some greenery uh, and then lake meat start going down it went down in those four years from 2000 to 2004 it went down 18 meters but by now that's even worse uh, it, there's almost no water uh, and of course hoover dam is a critical infrastructure from a touristic point of view, from a, a power production, and for the uh, you know the storage of water as well, so three different areas are affected. But this happens in all these areas of Lake Powell, uh, and there is one example. This one is really terrible uh, near uh, Salt Lake City. This lake that already half of the water is gone but it gets a lot of sediment from these three rivers, Bear, Weber, and Jordan. Um, but those sediments have no way to get out of that lake. So if, if that lake would run out of water, people will to live in Salt Lake City because the dust of arsenic, which, is, which produces cancer, would flood the city. So here you start seeing long-term effects of, of climate change. Of course, a few years ago, we would have floods here, and now you can walk in those rocks. Okay, and there are plenty of pictures that you can compare last year to this year in August. Uh, this is in France, this is in Germany, this is in China. Um, this is this August, uh, in Bullfrog Creek, what I was telling you about the war. You have 10 million people that are all over the place. Uh, you can imagine how they could benefit from having a card that contains all their information for health purposes. Okay, so fires, you can see the acres also in Europe, tremendous consequences from that. And of course, the advances that we have made in science and technology allow us to live longer. Uh, and this creates a problem because uh, suddenly uh, our body parts either need to be replaced or fixed. So we become very expensive and this is unsustainable. Uh, so this week we're going to become 8 billion according to the statistics and uh, but we were just two and a half billion in 1950 this is in my lifetime probably many of you were not born but it's it's shocking when you when you see all these things going on and of course this is the paradigm i told you the, at, at first from birth to death going through prevention and of course this creates opportunities for the students in the micro level and the macro level, public health and informatics at the uh, genetic and cellular level. As you move to the right, you become older, you have to go to more uh, uh, specialists. Every time I go to a specialist, they ask me, so I smoke. Uh, I always say no, but nobody asks me, where do I live or where did I live? When I went to UCLA, 
breeding in Los Angeles was equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So my lungs smoked. Uh, thank you very much. And my dad smoked a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. And second smoke, it's worse than smoking. So this makes it even more complex. But people don't think critically and don't ask those questions. And of course, what I was telling you about the expense, uh, the daily population, in, in the bottom line is uh, the net increase every day is a quarter million people. Every four days, we have one more million. Uh, they need water, they need food, they need energy. Um, I told you who makes the decisions. Urbanization is the other side of, of uh, and this is with communicable diseases. As more and more people get together or closer, the propagation of infectious diseases is more likely to happen. So look just in India, Delhi, how it went from a few million in the 70s. Uh, now it's over 30 million. This is uh, a map that shows you how things are going to be progressing this, this century. And uh, there are going to be 20 mega cities. 13 of them will be in Africa, which is growing five times faster than the rest of the world. And seven will be from Asia. And this brings the issue of digital divide. Um, I was looking at the World Economic Forum last year, and I noticed that Pakistan and Bangladesh towards the bottom, they only have 17.1 and 12.9% of their population with access to internet. So I created this chart that has the 20 top cities. Now, these are not countries, these are cities. So you can imagine what this means to infectious diseases. Uh, cities like Kinshasa and Congo, the only 91% today and because the growth is so fast, they're not going to be able to keep up. So the chances are they're, they're going to remain poor. And uh, with no resources, 91% have no access to internet. If you go down on the list to the number 19, Mogadishu, 98% has no access to internet. If we go to the US, this is a study of last year in July 27. And you see all the counties in the US between 22 and 62 percent of the ones that look whitish, uh, those counties, that percentage does not have access to internet. So it's not a monetary issue in some ways. Uh, I'm trying to make fast access internet as the utility of the 21st century, the same way that in the 20th century, houses would come with water, electricity, and gas. I want them to come with fast access internet. But of course, if you don't have a house, if you don't have food, if you don't have water, uh, internet is not a priority in your life. And uh, this is part of the new model. In, in 2006, when I saw the reports of what was going on with emergency centers, I wrote a chapter of a book, uh, Transforming the Home into a Safe Heaven, where I connected telephones, computers, uh, televisions, your credit card to buy things from the market, the uh, internet. Uh, of course, this, this uh, appeared in 2007, and this is exactly what we did last year and the year before with COVID. Uh, we did the distance learning, telework, telemedicine, e-commerce. The technologies were there, but people would not think critically. And now, Nobody questions telemedicine. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in our conferences, uh, despite of COVID, we're going to keep doing hybrids because those that cannot uh, travel might benefit from going to a conference this way. So it affects everything. It affects education, work, health. Uh, geomedicine, then, a big, big deal. April of this year, for the first time ever, we found plastic in the lung of a human, uh, blood. Well, we throw it to the earth, 
the fish eat plastic, we eat the fish, we get that. Uh, of course, we could get radiation and so on. Um, the EPA created this air quality index that goes up to 500. In uh, New Delhi, they were able to measure 999 in that scale. Uh, so today, um, 9 million people die from air contamination, water contamination. Basically, the three um, diseases, uh, infectious diseases like uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, if you add those deaths multiplied by three, that's in the number of people that are dying now from uh, pollution. So medical services, uh, we have a big problem in the US with that, very large numbers. And of course, the information, when you work here in the US, you get health, you get dental, you get vision. It's not the same package. Uh, you might not meant, want to mental health to be on your record because you might not get a promotion if they know that you have depression. The problem is that you go to surgery, the anesthesiologist does not know that uh, you're taking an antidepressant, you become a statistic. Vaccine registries, we do not incorporate them into our records. Uh, if you live in multiple cities, multiple countries, multiple specialists, okay, all this stuff needs to create it into something that will look like this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. In 09, and you can find this information on internet, I held at the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine here in Washington, a meeting. Uh, this was when Obama was doing healthcare reform. Basically, the paradigm was reform is necessary, but not sufficient transformation along the lines of what I told you earlier was needed. So I invited 20 agencies from the federal government. I invited 30 different professional organizations, each one to do this transdisciplinarity that we're discussing here. So each one could use their lenses uh, to suggest how we could deal with it. And uh, Concluding, we need to teach our students critical thinking. Everything in my view is connected and yet disconnected. Population growth, energy use, globalization, you know, global warming, of course, excessive waste. Um, well, you can read it. I don't wanna go through that, but wellness through geomedicine and public health informatics, uh, that's forming the system. I, I believe that we need to do that. So um, I will add uh, a, a, just a remark that it is my plan to invite and have some sort of community and SSIT meeting uh, sometime in January, where like eventually every student chapter around the world to focus on an area that specifically affects either their city, their region, or their country. So it's a plan for action. I, I want each chapter to deal with something. Um, and uh, I would like to encourage the writing of articles that are to a different crowd. Um, I would like to promote working with um, not, not giving talks at SSIT meetings alone, but with other groups, uh, with a triple S. So we combine science with human rights and privacy advocates that are gauging what's going on. And of course, uh, within IEEE, I like to make associations. I would love to have individuals that belong to computers or communications to become like associate director, um, associate editors of their own magazines, time to time, some segment that touches those core values of SSIT. That, in my view, will attract more people. It's a different way of outreaching, uh, but that's the way my head is wired. I love you all. Send your kids to Katina and Roba and. Uh, Thank you so very much, Professor um, 
and I could not do justice the richness of the presentation that you've just given us in terms of summarizing it. Uh, but there was so much that was present for me that I, I just wanted to acknowledge. And um, as I do, so I really welcome others who've got questions or uh, comments for Professor to please feel welcome to put them in the chat. But really what spoke to me from your uh, presentation, Professor, was really around how national security needs to be thought about in re these really interconnected ways, in these open ways. And uh, I really took away this notion of more inclusive approaches that actually if we try and think about these interconnected systems, um, we can actually come up with ways to, to, to better meet the needs of, of a whole range of um, communities and a whole range of people in those in those societies yeah. that can help yeah. us to to shift to more um transformative yeah. ways of, of living um, sometimes it's difficult mariana to accentuate some some issues for example 22 percent of the world uh, does not have shelter or what we call home infrastructure uh, about 84 percent makes something between two dollars and and twenty dollars a day. Uh, uh, that's 84% of the world. Only 7% have attended college. 14% uh, cannot read or write. And then 1% is starving, 15 out malnutrition. I mean, there's so many issues, but uh, education is it's, it's the best start uh, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. I really welcome those comments. And I just wanted to play back that for me personally, I really felt that your presentation was was quite heavy for me. I mean, there's a lot of heaviness and a, and a lot that you've talked through, and it's important, I think, to acknowledge that. And picking up on one of the things that you mentioned about people aren't paying attention to these interconnected natures, the local, the global, the global, and the local, and so on. Rova. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you, Professor Kuhn, for an excellent presentation, as Mariana mentioned, so rich in its coverage of topics. Um, quite heavy as Mariana mentioned I really appreciate the emphasis early on on threat perception and the notion of perception and that ties to to a, a lot of work in the multidisciplinary space in the interdisciplinary space and transdisciplinarity how we think about perception and then how we tie that to um, ways of moving forward within the scope of those uh, varied perception. Uh, we did speak about education briefly now, and I really appreciate your um, integration of the idea of starting really early on. So not thinking about education just in terms of higher education, but I think there's an element there of education, public awareness campaigns and other elements that sit not at the periphery, but should be quite core to, to what you were suggesting. Now, given this complexity and the need to think about these complex systems, these systems of systems, as we thought, as we, um, excuse me, saw in earlier presentations and in earlier sessions, um, and then thinking about um, the disconnected nature of those systems as well simultaneously. How do we uh, realistically, how do we practically go forward or move forward or proceed in a way that allows us to capture that complexity, but also capture simultaneously that disconnectedness if we are educating at a variety of levels? It seems like quite a, a, a complex endeavor. What are some yeah. practical strategies in your extensive experience to, well, to approach this? Yeah, well, the, the way I look at the education, it might be a little bit different. I know it's different from the system that I see here in the US. Um, and I'm not talking about university. I'm talking about the early years, uh, the first 12 years of your education. Uh, in my view, school is 50% academics, but 50% is social. You, you there learn to, to make friends, to deal with bullies, to, uh, to enjoy, to play, to be creative, you still are not involved in politics or anything. So, so it's a great time to learn uh, things that are not being taught. The single element that has saved more lives is not vaccines or antibiotics, it's washing your hands, and you learn that in school. Uh, all the problems of obesity could be solved if we taught diet and nutrition in school, if we taught uh, relaxation. We know that one of the four big issues uh, for heart disease is stress. Well, why don't we teach yoga? Uh, so, so suddenly the educational system becomes part of the health system. See the interconnectedness. And, uh, but uh, of course, 
there is an issue of of money but uh but it, it is my view that there are two things that should be universal one is health the other one is education uh, and uh, it is unfortunate that that some people think that they're saving money but the the more educated people are the better income that we'll have therefore the better diet uh the less crime perhaps um there are too many things connected and uh, so so i think that that part there uh, I, I i could never understand how people in this country uh, are choosing subject matters in high school everybody should learn history of the world and geography and and be able to communicate with individuals of other lands uh, uh, everybody should learn one language i don't care which one and then when they graduate go to the country that speaks that that language to learn uh, what they do before they go into working uh, that's part of the education well that doesn't happen but it should happen it's a different way of thinking but i think uh, we could construct a better societies that are, that care more for each other um, and there is more cohesiveness instead of just competition for everything uh, you know uh, the the country that maybe had the vaccines might save themselves temporarily but other forms of the virus are being developed by those that did not get the vaccine in the first place so um if you vaccinate everybody if if you could do that on the same day everybody vaccinated the thing is over uh, that that's usually what happened with polio uh, smallpox and many other diseases uh, that that successfully were eradicated um, um but uh now now uh, we we don't do that and that that creates uh big big problems um but i i i don't know these, these are many things that are based on on social skills and and i am afraid that because of the um of the of of this little devices um we are not um as much time playing outside uh and uh, i mean it's wonderful uh, in the sense that i can call via whatsapp with all my friends from school years uh, in uruguay and other parts of the world uh but uh but it, it's important to go dancing to 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 eat with friends uh to go to sports events and not being in a party when you're talking to other person through the phone it's it's hard to believe but but that's i saw that <laughs> and uh, yeah anyway i know i don't I want think, to dwell no i think that's a very important point when you're talking about um technology the the sort of interplay between the technical and the non-technical and i might just pick up on one point to do with um uh, the critical infrastructure work that you presented and i know you've got so much more to present on that i've had the good fortune of, of seeing those presentations of yours um professor Kuhn. Uh, so we talk about um you know the um, unintended consequences of of the technical of the technological excuse me and i was just recalling some work that katina and i um have uh, conducted in the past around critical infrastructure protection and uh, we conducted um, empirical work in that specific project where the outcomes uh, suggested that we need to find some kind of balance between the technical and the non-technical. So in your presentation today, you mentioned uh, uh, the role that technology played in facilitating a lot of the engagement interaction uh, conferences and the like in the context of the pandemic and now you suggested what the device is doing to us in terms of social skills and interactions so we found there was this um, need to balance for lack of a better term the technical and the non-technical and that um, it was really important to look at multiple solutions so some of our outcomes just off the top of my head um, we needed to look at solutions that target specific stakeholders and not think about things uh, in a homogenous fashion there was also the role of regulation and the government and that many elements both 
technical and non-technical in nature uh, needed to be considered, Professor Kuhn. So given that complexity, given the fact that we have this uh, exchange between the local and the global issues, what can SSIT or what is your hope and vision for SSIT uh, moving forward next year in building that community? Uh, where do you start as a community of um, or as a society? Uh, because we've got some, some ideas, for instance, in, in the technical committee, Katina and I, you've got some amazing ideas that we've heard in the past. Where would you start? Uh, again, back to that idea of complexity. How do you navigate between the technical and non-technical, the complexity that those elements bring? I know lots of questions there, but I'm just thinking um, there's quite a lot there. Um, we have uh, grand visions but there are also these grand societal challenges. Is there anything, um, uh, operationally speaking, or in terms of operationalization, uh, where we can start as a society and where do you hope to take the society moving forward? Sorry, lots there. Please feel free to just choose one aspect to comment on. Yeah, I, I think that some areas are more difficult than others just because of that uh, different choices of infrastructures that I showed when I was showing you France, et cetera. Um, so it's not like you have a standard uh, world where everybody has the same the same thing. And uh, but in addition, I mean, th there is so much ground that I could I could not cover, but that I I feel, for, for example. The challenges that we have today, if we go 50 years back, which, which is the time frame that SSIT was created, are different. Uh, we already have five bubbles in the context of SSIT that we are focusing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to add a new one, which is privacy and uh, security of information because I believe that the, the way social media is spreading information so, so fast that a society uh, does not even know what to do. Uh, in other words, we, we are producing technologies without knowing the consequences of, of, of that because we don't even know how to use them well enough. Um, so I, I think it's, it's important to, to find colleagues that can deal with different angles of that same technology. Because um, as, as an example, I could use a drone in Africa to bring blood or medications to a hospital, but somebody else could use the same drone to bring a bomb and kill people. So there, there are positive and negative consequences of using the same technology. Um, there was a series of articles. Um, I was the founder and editor-in-chief of the Springer Health and Technology Journal. If you go to December 2017, there was a special issue that dealt with uh, privacy and security of medical information. Um, there were people from all over the world. Uh, the, 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 there were 20 different uh, ideas in some ways. Uh, some, some maybe were repeated, but, but my point is this. In the US, the privacy rules usually deal with uh, economic issues. If somebody finds out that I have a heart condition or cancer or I'm propens uh, propensity for that, then uh, my insurance might go up two times, three times, or I might be negated then. Uh, but if I'm in Rwanda and they find out that I'm a Tutsi, I might be part of a genocide. And if I'm in Nigeria and I'm Catholic, evangelist or Jewish, I might be killed. Uh, so genetic information in the US is very private. In the Finland, 
it's public property because the government pays for it. And so somebody from Finland wrote there. The IT minister of Rwanda wrote in that article. Uh, Adhar, which is a system that affects 1.4 billion people in India, uh, the only politician that was against the use of that because of privacy concerns, he wrote an article as well. And these are all, you can download them for free. And by, and by the way, uh, I'm since 2020, I'm not the editor anymore. But what I did is I, I did an Excel sheet and I have it in my presentation towards the end uh, because I even looked uh, this week to see where we are in terms of downloads. To give you, to give you an idea, uh, 400 to 800 is a normal number of downloads of any article. Uh, 1,500, you would consider it, that's a lot. One of the one of the articles was uh, this great lady that wrote about the um, association that the National Health System of England with uh, it's a Google tool. On the first week that was just put on the web, the issue was not ready, but that article was put on the web. Fifteen thousand downloads occurred. Okay. Um, and uh, so by the time that there were all these people from Hungary, from uh, Estonia, where everything that they do is in electronic, is digital, uh, and they were hacked by the Russians. I mean, they, they, all, all types of um, good ideas and good articles and good writers. Um, I don't know, maybe by, by 2018 or 2019, there were 137,000. Well, right now it's 199,000 downloads. <laughs> and not all the articles are for free and yet people go. And I, I will tell you this, that journal was made for medical physicists and biomedical engineers. I would, I would assure you that the greatest number of that 199,000 are neither one or the other. There are lawyers that want to know about privacy. And that's what I'm saying. You have to get out of your little mind because you're focused on something that might be very important. But, but there are others that can learn from you and can use it in a different way. In 1988, I was working in Dallas. There was a Dr. Stephen Harms that worked at Baylor. He worked on trying to detect breast cancer in women. He bought an IBM system. I was working for IBM at the time. He was working, uh, he bought a system called RISC 6000. And he said, Luis, I don't have any software for this. What should I do? I went to the Palo Alto Scientific Center because I remember a colleague of mine, Ralph Bernstein, who was managing image processing, he had an employee by the name of Bill Hansen that developed some algorithms to, to deal with images from satellites. Okay. And I asked this man if we could transfer that software to this man in Dallas after you know doing uh, some documentation and this and that he got that i forgot about it in 1996 i'm working for the agency for healthcare policy and research in washington my boss asked me if i could attend this meeting that is on technology transfer i go there and i see uh, an article by dr stephen harms detecting breast cancer in women on the RIS 6000 using the algorithms that were developed for satellite image processing. Well, uh, and the same thing happened. The Naval Research Lab developed some algorithms to detect mines at the bottom of the ocean. Um, Duke University grabbed that and tried to detect cancer. And now, 
the University in Pennsylvania use it routinely to detect kidney cancer, okay? How many physicians are gonna get into a magazine that deals with mines at the bottom of the ocean? Okay, so there's a lot of things that, there's a lot of solution in other words that already exist that we are unaware because it's not our field. But when you bring this transdisciplinarity, you start discovering, oh, we have something here and we use it in this way. Well, can we use it this other way? I don't know. Well, let's try it. Boom. So in my view, um, librarians should be involved in the future on how we store information. Because they know how to store information, but the old ways might not be the best for this multidisciplinary uh, mambo jumbo of people from all over the world speaking different languages. So you might need automatic ma machine translation. So, but it might be in a country that doesn't speak your language and yet they might have your, the solution that you're seeking. So th this is the complexity of the digital world, but, but it's fascinating that we can find solutions. If we look, how do we look? Well, that's what we should be discussing with uh, intelligent people like, uh, like Roba and Mariana, boom. And of course, Katina, which I see her up there, really small, but. Professor Cohen, thank you so much for sharing, again, the richness of your knowledge and for giving us the opportunity to learn from you and to continue to learn from others in this forum. Uh, with that line of thinking in mind, uh, it's my great pleasure and sincere honour to be able to introduce our next, um, our next speakers. We've got Professor uh, Katina Michaels, of course, from ASU. And of course, we've got the very esteemed senior lecturer from a uh, University of Wollongong, uh, Roba Abbas, who's going to engage us in some open discussion and conversation around transdisciplinarity and, so, and socio-technical considerations, picking up on a lot of the points that you began to, to introduce and talk through Professor Quinn. So Roba, without further ado, I'll hand over to you to, to take the floor from here. And thank you again, Professor Quinn. Thank you so much, Mariana, and I wanted to echo that. Thanks, Professor Kuhn, for such an insightful presentation. And, and I think we really engaged in that open discussion that Katina and I were hoping to facilitate as part of a, our presentation. Mariana, I might just take five minutes just to go through, reinforce some of the ideas that Professor Kuhn mentioned. I'm happy to be interrupted at any point for the purposes of discussion, but both Katina and I are delighted to be here today introducing some of the recent initiatives within the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of technology, so SSIT that Professor Kuhn uh, mentioned, um, uh, and he's uh, eloquently put a um, uh, proposed vision for SSIT. And we're specifically going to uh, talk within the few minutes that we have about one of the technical committees that falls within SSIT that we have been chairing this year and that we've established around socio-technical uh, systems and hopefully looking to uh, connect the discussion of socio-technical systems to transdisciplinarity, uh, building further on Professor Kuhn's excellent remarks on the open discussion that we've just had and on moving forward towards that connectedness between uh, transdisciplinarity and how we achieve transdisciplinary um, or tra transdisciplinarity through socio-technical design or through engaging in socio-technical processes. So how do we operationalize things? Um, I thought I'd provide a brief overview about the society initially, but um, Professor Kuhn did mention and allude to the society, which was founded in 1972. And really the intention of SSIT was to provide a forum for dialogue and inquiry into the intended and unintended and the desirable and undesirable impacts and implications of technology. And in doing so, there are uh, key areas of which Professor Kuhn mentioned he'd like to add another. I believe this is um, to what you were referring, Professor Kuhn, uh, areas such as sustainable development and humanitarian technology and emphasis on ethics, human values and technology. 
how technology can um, provide benefits for all and the area that Katina and I are very much invested in at the moment around the societal impact of technology, which we have rebadged socio-technical implications and socio-technical systems, and also not forgetting protecting the planet and sustainable technologies. And I think, Professor Kuhn, you've covered all those areas as part of your talk, and we could listen for hours uh, uh, to that depth of knowledge and experience. I did also want to flag that something really important that was also um, uh, picked up on was the idea of uh, publication and the importance of publications being accessible across the board and to multiple communities. And there are publications of SSIT in the IEEE Technology and Society magazine, which is led by um, the brilliant Professor Jeremy Pitt from Imperial College London as its editor-in-chief and um, the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society or TTS, with the co-founding editor of which is Professor Katina Michael, and not forgetting events for this kind of outreach to promote this kind of dialogue in the IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society. Um, so I did want to talk briefly within the time that we have about socio-technical systems, specifically our committee, and provide maybe a minute or two for Katina for some reflections, and then we would welcome further discussion post-SINs, post-ISTAS, to see how we can build this, what we are framing as a transdisciplinary community of practice. The idea here is this community of practice can be assembled in a manner to enable transnational, transsector, and transinstitutional collaboration, again, toward that knowledge co production and transfer. Uh, we have developed somewhat of a what we call a charter around the technical committee that really uh, specifies the themes that we'd like to cover. And as you can see, they're quite um, rich and quite broad. A lot of these themes, things like the micro, the meso, the macro, Professor Kuhn mentioned in his presentation. I think, Professor Kuhn, you've covered off almost every single one of those points in your uh, conversation, in your um, presentation around complexity, needing to think holistically. So technical committee themes that we're thinking about and that we'd like to emphasize and elevate uh, to encourage dialogue around these themes include the social implications of existing technologies, also those advanced, complex and emerging technologies, things to do with design, with ethics, with values. And in the interest of time, I might talk to some of those, um, how we've operationalized uh, that vision for the technical committee through a number of initiatives. So one such initiative is our public interest technology colloquium series, of which we're currently in series four. And series four was designed uh, specifically as a forum for transdisciplinary dialogue. We have individuals who are present here today, such as Ms. Mariana Zephyrokopoulos, uh, Professor Marcus Wigan, uh, Associate Professor Rob Nichols, who have contributed so greatly to this colloquium and have out enriched our understanding of how we actually, as we phrased it, illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity. So that's one initiative. There are other initiatives talking again to your point, Professor Kuhn, of how do we get information out there in the form of publications? And we have a current active call for special issues around how do we publish beyond for academia or beyond for specific expertise or experts looking to publish for or publishing for social, technical and scientific impact and reflecting on the transdisciplinary outcomes there. Um, we also have an, the IEEE International Symposium on Digital Privacy and Social Media, which was very much approached from a transdisciplinary perspective and the associated special issue call for papers, which is currently active and was recently released as part of um, the IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine um, special issue. And again, not forgetting our um, work as part of this particular workshop in securitization for sustainability of people in place, really issuing that call for transdisciplinarity and the need to focus on streams of thought, thinking about transdisciplinarity of the person, of place, of securitization through transdisciplinarity as per this session, and also looking at some of the socio-historical origins of securitization, thinking about rights, thinking about history, as you suggested, Professor Kuhn, the importance of that, and so much more. Um, and with that, I guess uh, the, what we are trying to encourage here and promote is how we think about the theoretical basis for all of this. What binds all of these initiatives together? And how can we theorize, conceptualize, and operationalize those socio-technical ideas into something that can form uh, somewhat of a transdisciplinary uh, agenda, for lack of a better word? 
and this session we hope um, will, uh, I guess, uh, we can commence um, the exploration and the understanding of the significance of the socio-technical as linked to transdisciplinarity. And with that, I might pause and Katina, um, just uh, in terms of timing, we might get a, a brief reflection from you, your thoughts about the committee, about Professor Kun's presentation and the open discussion that we had previously. And, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Roba and uh, Lewis, what a, a wonderful, enlightening uh, presentation that was as well with Mariana. Um, I think the timing is definitely now. We have Lewis, uh, who's now president-elect and uh, has that vast experience, uh, both in defence and also uh, more generally within many societies within IEEE, uh, particularly health and society at large uh, in terms of social implications and emerging technologies. Um, I do remember a phone call on a Sunday morning to my home in 2006, uh, where Lewis called and said, you know, this is going to happen and how we're going to prepare an urgency about his message. And uh, we know, Roba, from work uh, and collaboration that we've begun with uh, the High Bar Research Alliance, that this urgency and this intensity of small bursty projects may be lasting between six weeks and three months, uh, the way that we may bring together um, groups that address societal challenges. Uh, I would say, Lewis, uh, on the other side of the world, uh, Rover has been a brainchild of the socio-technical systems approach, and it was a, a stroke of genius when she decided to rename the Emerging Technologies Group to something that was more active and actionable and uh, an interventionist in some way, a socio-technical interventionist. But transdisciplinarity is at the heart of socio-technical systems and socio-technical design, it's a natural fit. And so when we talk about interconnectedness, it's not just in the systems, but in the humans that build those systems. And as you say, uh, a call to action at the education tertiary level, perhaps in high school level, how are we meeting the needs of uh, creating skill sets uh, in our young people who are going to be our next leaders uh, that can look at problems from different lenses and can talk a common ontology like Norbert Wiener hoped for in the Macy conferences in the 1940s, uh, talking to anthropologists, sociologists, um, uh, medical professionals, uh, and much more when he was looking at uh, information control, feedback systems, and feedback loops. So I think the time is now, and what we need is a, a force of, like, in, in the realm of this committee, this technical committee, to drive an agenda uh, that permeates throughout all of IEEE. I know that's music to your ears, that's something you've always wanted to do and you are doing in your own way, but I think a, a greater platform now uh, where we have plans within IEEE, a bit like the High Bar Research Alliance, but perhaps, um, you know, that will emerge and uh, as Robert always says, we can't say what people want, we have to co-design. So perhaps not forcing a model that we think will work, but asking people what will work. But that were just some of my reflections. There couldn't have been a more complimentary talk today than yours, Lewis and Robers. Yeah, um, let me, if, if I may, um, I was, when, when I was at the National Defense University, um, I, I had the unique uh, opportunity to be in a team that uh, worked with the Russians uh, to create a common language uh, for cyber defense, and uh, you can you can get the reference uh, from the East West Institute. The, there is a booklet that has that terminology, and uh, but I I cannot express to you <laughs> in in a simple form the the amount of time that it would take to agree on a single word on the, because the dictatorships versus democracy or whatever you want to call it, different ways of thinking. Uh, for, for the Chinese, if you send a marketing information, uh, well, you're, you're flooding their screen, uh, which we see every day, you know, uh, you get to get your mail and you get bombarded for, with the cookies. For, well, uh, down there, that's a cyber attack. 
because uh, committed to get information outside uh, certain boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's it's not it's not easy when you're dealing with different cultures and and people living with different fears uh, to solve some of these issues. And uh, but uh, in any case, I I I think that uh, next July when I go down there. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to expand in a, in a lot of stuff. Absolutely. And we very much look forward to that. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kung, for your time. We can speak for such a long time about these issues and just be able to scratch the surface, particularly that final point, which I'd like to end up on the uh, the idea of um, translating uh, across disciplines is, I think, what you, what you were referring to, that mechanism for how we sort of agree on things as being quite complex. Um, and, uh, and I think that's something we need to look deeper into. I know Marcus Wigan is on the call and has so much to say about that and also being a transdisciplinary scholar can add so much um, to that particular conversation. Are you familiar with semantic web? Yes, absolutely. There, there was a meeting that was held in 03 uh, in the White House. Um, there, there was a book that 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 came with that with that title, Semantic Web. And I remembered my first day, my first week in IBM. Uh, I heard there is problems in the CCU. And being a biomedical engineer, I immediately thought, because I was working with the hospital team, I immediately thought this is the coronary care unit, CCU. And but as the conversation kept going, I, I it was completely disconnected from what they were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, until I finally realized that it was the communication control unit. <laughs> because... yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And that's just one of, I'm sure, many examples. With that, Professor Kuhn, I'm afraid we're out of time for our particular session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're honoured to have you here and with us. And we look forward to continuing this discussion because we uh, feel like there's just so much more to cover. Thank you so much. And I might move.